Okay, so, so I want to start by uh, discussing some of the natural resources that we have in our planet and how we use them in our everyday life. So behind me is uh, a few pictures of a few different natural resources that basically our entire lives are based on. We have a picture of coal, of natural gas, and of oil. And these are basically our fossil resources. We call them our fossil resources because they're produced through the decomposition of the organic species that have existed on Earth for about the past billion years. Basically, all the plants and animals that have lived on this Earth die, they decompose, they're compressed down, and they form these natural resources such as coal, natural gas, and oil. Now, these natural resources are very simply made up of carbon and hydrogen, mostly. And these are very energy-rich species that also make for uh, all of the fuels that we use every day, and a majority of the commodities that we use every day come from these natural resources. In addition, up here I have a picture of air. Air is composed of nitrogen and oxygen, very simply, but these are very, very important molecules in our everyday life. In addition, I have a picture of water. Water is hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, but in addition, we use this everywhere in our everyday life. And lastly, the picture of trees, of vegetation, these are equally as important. So basically what I want to get across here is these natural resources are composed of four elements. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And each one of these different natural resources is composed of various molecular structures. So these four different atoms are arranged in such a way that they create molecules. Each one of these natural resources contains, except for water and air, thousands of different molecular structures composed of these different four simple elements. Right. And these are what make our everyday life what it is today. So over the past 100 or 150 years or so, humanity has become very, very good at figuring out how to manipulate these molecular structures. So as I said, each one of these natural resources has their various unique molecular structures. What we do is we take these molecular structures, these hydrogens, these carbons, these nitrogens and oxygens, we break them down, we cut them apart. We build, and then we build them back up into whatever we need to use for our everyday life, mostly because we all want to live very convenient lives. And that's basically the goal behind using natural resources and how we manipulate these atoms. So to give you a little bit better feel of what I'm talking about here, I have a few pictures up here of types of things that make your everyday lives so convenient. The first one, and perhaps in my mind the most amazing, is fertilizer. Um, over the past few thousand years, back to Mesopotamia, people had learned how to do what's called crop rotating. Basically, people learned that when you grow plants out of soil, you use up some of the natural resources in this soil. And back in a few thousand years ago, we learned that if you can uh, grow something one year, leave this dirt alone for a year, the dirt will replenish itself with some natural resources that are absolutely necessary to once again grow your crops that you need to live every day the next year. Well, the population on the Earth has exponentially grown uh, since 2,000 years ago, or basically since about 1,400 or so. And what's happened is we've reached the point where we can no longer sustain using crop rotation to develop all of the vegetation that we need to sustain our lives. And so what we learn to do as humans is we learn to take our natural resources, mostly nitrogen, which is 80% of the atmosphere, and hydrogen, which comes from our fossil resources, and we've learned how to manipulate these molecular structures to form ammonia. Ammonia is then forced into fertilizer, and now we can make synthetic nutrients, and we can grow crops all year long over the same dirt as we synthetically produce fertilizer that actually allows us to continue to grow vegetation. And that's what this, or that's what this picture shows us up here. This is fertilizer, and this comes from the natural resources and this comes from our ability to man manipulate the molecular structures of our natural resources and form ammonia, NH3, a nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms. In addition, what I have here is a picture of gasoline. We all know this very well. It's uh, probably a bane of most of your existence, particularly if you travel from LA to Riverside or if you travel or commute in any large distances. It's very expensive and it's absolutely a requirement for your everyday life. Basically, gasoline looks somewhat similar to the oil that comes out of the ground, or some fraction of the oil that comes out of the ground. But when we remove oil from the ground, or coal from the ground, what we do is we separate some different molecular structures, we break them down, we build them up, we add hydrogen atoms where we need to, we add carbon atoms where we need to, and we turn this into a fuel that's very energy dense, we can put into our car, and we can drive everywhere we go. 
This is gasoline, but it is a manipulated molecular structure compared to what comes out of the ground naturally. The last thing I have here is plastics. Um, lots of times people think of oil and think of fossil resources, right? And you think of this purely in terms of the energy that we use every day, whether it's electricity or whether it's fuel. But in actuality, the fossil resources we have are basically our only resource that has carbon atoms in it and hydrogen atoms. And we use these carbon and hydrogen atoms for everything in our everyday life. One very good example is plastic. Plastic is basically just long chains of carbons and hydrogens. And what we do is we take oil, we fractionate it down, we take a few of the components that are major components in oil, and we figure out how to link these, link these together. And we create very long chains, and these long chains are ending up to use or ending up used to create plastics. And plastics, although unnecessary, make your life very convenient. And this is all done through the manipulation of the natural resources that we have. So how do we do this? Um, this graph and what it shows up here is actually fairly unimportant. What's more important is how I'm going to describe it. So what we do is we figure out how to take the molecular structures and we figure out how to make them interact the way we want them to. We figure out how to, with putting in as little energy as possible, make these molecules interact, break down, and build up into the structures that we want. So let's take for a case example nitrogen the composition of air is mostly made of, and hydrogen molecules. Two very simple molecules, just two nitrogen atoms bonded together and two hydrogen atoms bonded together. Now if you put them in some chamber, some enclosed environment, and you heated this up, nothing would happen for a very, very long time. You would have to put a very significant amount of energy into this system to make these nitrogen atoms or nitrogen molecules and hydrogen molecules want to interact and want to do anything. Basically, it's almost unfeasible to put enough energy into this system to get this nitrogen molecule and this hydrogen molecule to interact and rearrange to form ammonia, what we put into our fertilizer. <coughs> now, as chemical engineers and as humans, what we've done is we've developed what are called catalysts. Uh, this is a word I'm sure you guys are all uh, very aware of and use on your daily life. And it's basically a word that means a, a vehicle for change, right? And in the chemical industry, what this means to us is we create materials that facilitate reactions. We create materials that interact with molecules, and they interact with them in such a way that they facilitate the desired reaction that we're looking for. And so what they do is they provide unique pathways for these molecules to see each other, to look at each other, and to interact the way we want them to, and to build back up and form the molecules that make our everyday life so convenient. And this happens through a process called catalysis. We basically develop catalysts. These catalysts interact with the natural resources that we have, and they interact with them in such a way that they produce the products that we need every day. Okay? So let's step back a little bit here and go to a different skin. So I'm going to keep using this example of ammonia because it's so important in your everyday life. Okay? So ammonia is a, about a trillion dollar a year industry. Okay? This represents about 2% of the world's GDP. And about 2% of the energy uses in the usage in the world is based on producing ammonia. Okay? So I show here a picture of a typical ammonia production plant. A typical ammonia production plant is maybe about a square mile. And it produces maybe about 100 million pounds of ammonia a year. So these are massive scale processes, almost unfathomably massive. But not as unfathomable as actually how these processes take place. So when we zoom in, what we have is a chemical reactor. A chemical reactor is basically a big cylinder, maybe about the size of my arm's length, maybe about a meter or two in diameter. Okay? We have our natural resources, our nitrogen and our hydrogen that enter this reactor, and they interact with our catalyst material. Okay? And this catalyst material changes their composition, their molecular structure, and out of the backside comes ammonia. Okay? So when we look at this, we say, okay, so this is a process that happens on the scale of about my arm's width about a meter or so. And the whole process, this chemical plant, is maybe about a square mile. But actually, when we zoom in, and we zoom into the scale where these molecules are actually interacting, and they're interacting with each other, and they're interacting on the catalyst surface, this happens at the atomic scale. What I show here is what's called a transmission electron micrograph. Basically, we use electrons to image materials. And what I show here is the atomic scale. This is a picture of a catalyst. Right on the edge of this catalyst here is where these molecules come to the surface, interact, break down, and build up and form the molecules that you want. The amazing part about this to me is that we actually have to zoom in one trillion times 
from the scale of the chemical plant to reach the scale where these reactions actually happen and to reach the scale that we actually need to be able to manipulate so that we can produce the ammonia we want. Now just to give you a feel of what one trillion times zooming in means, it's very similar to an entity the size of the solar system being able to manipulate our interactions, our movements, and our interrelations on a time scale that's relational to us. So basically, imagine an entity the size of the solar system that can move us around, that can interact with us the way we want to. That's what we're trying to do as humans. We're trying to zoom in and move molecules around the exact way we want and get them to interact the way we want. So that's the scale of length. And this is pretty amazing to me that we actually even try to do these things. Now think of the scale of time. These reactions take place in one quadrillionth of a second. One quadrillionth of a second. You can't even put this on any scale that would make sense when you compare it to how you think in terms of seconds. Okay? This is, you compare this to the scale of uh, basically how long the universe has been around. That's the scale that this is uh, comparative to, to how you think of. So what we're trying to do is control events that happen in one quadrillionth of a second at scales that are basically unimaginable. So how do these things take place? Uh, these things take place by molecules coming in and hitting a catalyst surface. Basically, there's a number of different events. Our molecules come in and they land on what's called a catalyst surface. These atoms, these flat surfaces, a catalyst surface. These molecules come in, they land, they break apart, they interact, they build back up, and they come out the other side as the molecules that we want. And our whole goal is to engineer the properties of this surface to make these molecules do what we want them to do. Okay? So how do we do this? We do this by trying to use some technologies. We use quantum mechanics and we use nanotechnology. We use quantum mechanics and basically the amazing power of computers that we have nowadays to start to map out how these molecules change on a catalyst surface. And we can do these things with the amazing powers of the computer now. And what we also have is nanotechnology where we can engineer the structure and function of different materials at scales that are very, very small. These pictures are catalyst particles, and each one of them is about a thousand times smaller than the width of your hair. So what we're doing is engineering their surface properties so that they interact with molecules the way we want, and they form the products that we want. And we can actually, actually look down and view these things and understand these things fairly well nowadays. Even with all these amazing advancements that we've made, it's still not as good as it could be. Okay? So even with all these amazing advancements, the idea that we can actually look down and manipulate these things and control these things, we still have to provide a significant amount of energy into any reactor to make the molecules do what we want them to do. And we're still reliant on burning fossil fuels to provide this energy into the system to make the reactions do what we want them to do. Okay? So we're nowhere near as efficient as we could be or as we want to be because we're still relying on fossil fuels to heat these systems up and make the reactions happen the way we want them to. Okay? So I want to finish by leaving you with uh, the dream I have for the 21st century and also probably one of the hardest problems that we can think of solving as humans <clears throat> is utilizing sunlight. Okay? So I put up here that uh, humans are professional energy consumers. Basically, go to each one of your houses right now, there are probably lights on, there's a refrigerator on, a washing machine running. You use as much energy as you possibly can to make your life as convenient as you possibly can. Okay? So then we have this other thing, the sun. It shines light down every day on us, makes us happy when we hang out in the sun. Half the reason why we live in California is because the sun exists here all year long. Right? And the sun is a professional energy producer. It's a gigantic nuclear reactor that produces a lot of energy. Now the question uh, I asked myself before I gave this talk, and I've asked myself a few times before, is let's compare the amount of energy that we use as humanity to the amount of energy that hits the Earth in the form of sun. Okay? And when I, when I thought of sitting down and trying to compare these things, I had no idea which one was going to be greater. I had an idea it was the sun, but it really didn't make much sense to me because we haven't figured out how to harness the sun in any way, for any part of our lives really, besides providing us vitamin D and getting a nice tan. Right? But when you compare these things, uh, it turns out that the sun provides 50,000 times more energy to the Earth than humanity consumes. And we try really, really hard. And this is something that's really amazing to me, is we haven't figured out yet how to use the sun to our advantage. OK? 
okay? And so this is the dream for the 21st century, and I think one of the biggest problems that engineers need to face is figuring out how to use the sun both to produce energy, but also how to drive the chemical reactions that we use on a daily basis. Now, we have a really, really good starting point for figuring out how to do this, and it's nature. Over the billion years, nature has uh, evolved and turned into what you see as a leaf. A leaf is a really amazing chemical plant. It can take the natural resources of carbon dioxide and water, gets hit with sunlight, and through photosynthetic processes, it forms oxygen and sugar. Sugar is nature's fuel. Leaves have figured out how to do this. Of course, they've had a billion years of evolution, but humans think we're pretty smart, and I think we can catch up if we give it a try. So the dream for the 21st century, and the goal that we need to be able to reach, is to develop materials, catalysts, or vehicles for change that allow us to take sunlight our great natural resource, probably our greatest and most sustainable natural resource. Combine it with these natural resources that we find in the ocean and in the atmosphere and figure out how to turn these into the fuels and chemicals that make our everyday life so convenient. So with that, I thank you guys for your attention and hopefully you found this a bit interesting.